Um, Enterprise Florida, as a public-private partnership of business and government leaders, EFI is changing the landscape of economic development in Florida. It is no coincidence that Florida is among the most um, envied states in the nation. And a lot of people sometimes think, oh, it's gonna, people are gonna come here anyway. No, they help to identify the opportunities that we were strong, we were weak, build on those strengths, minimize those weaknesses. And we're pleased as an organization, Tax Watch, to work with others to work with Enterprise Florida. I've been on the board for over 20 years, but uh, it's really done a remarkable job. And I think it's something that if it didn't exist, we would have to create it. So upon its creation in 1996, Florida became the first state in the nation to place the principal responsibility of economic development, international trade, research and marketing in the hands of business and government partnership. It serves as the state's primary entity for trade and export development, supporting more than 60,000 Florida exporting businesses. The organization also assists small and minority businesses through its capital programs, supports Florida's defense industry through the Florida Defense Alliance, the Florida Defense Support Task Force, and champions sports industry growth throughout the Florida Sports Foundation. Its senior vice president is not with us today, but the Lord developer, but I'm here to uh, recognize Tyler Russell, who serves as the chief of staff for Enterprise Florida prior to joining EFI. Tyler serves as the deputy chief of staff for the Department of Management Services, overseeing legislative affairs, communications, and external affairs offices, along with administer administering the Florida Cyber Security Advisory Council. So <clears throat> you know how important that is, don't you? <laughs> So at the beginning of the uh, Governor Ron DeSantis administration, Tyler served as Deputy Policy Director on the Governor's Transition Team and then as Deputy Director of Legislative Affairs and the Executive Office of the Governor. He's got many years of experience working on state, local, and federal policy, as well as political campaigns, along with the private sector consulting. And probably most importantly, he's a graduate of Florida State University. Yay, go Knowles! You heard from uh, Lowe, Florida Tax Watch for over four years has been the independent and highly credible and impactful eyes and ears of the hardworking taxpayers of Florida. Um, as a 501c3 watchdog and public policy think tank, it's worked to reform taxes, protecting our state's enviable tax and regulatory environment, maximize the impact of state and local government spending, not against spending, just do it better, smarter, and more impactful. We have productivity awards program, we do budget turkeys, in fact, we're gonna recognize Governor Jeb Bush as Governor Vito Corleone. <laughs> he got that nickname because he vetoed about $2 billion of our projects we identified. Principal Leadership Awards, we also have a, which we share with our friends, Cindy O'Connell and, and Will, thank you uh, with your partnership. We have a prepaid uh, scholarship program partner with them to uh, give scholarships to principals, but also to, to the deserving students without whom probably would never be able to go to college. We've got many other partners here. I see Carol Dover. We worked on the for drink tax, got rid of that uh, nasty thing some years ago. We continue to work on don't eat your seed corn, don't take the money away from tourism. You think it'll always be here, but it won't. If anybody questions, just remember 9 11. You could roll a bowling ball down Miami Beach and not hit anybody for about two or three blocks back then. Last but not least, we have uh, one of our own here. I see Ash, Ash, where are you? Ash Williams. We uh, just want to a special plug for our past president chairman and a great, great, uh, incredible state leader. <clears throat> We're going to recognize Ash at the Florida Tax Watch meeting tomorrow night. And I think I have to say that because he's done such a great job as uh, leading the state with our nearly quarter trillion dollar investment portfolio of pension and excess funds. And that's the kind of leadership we try to promote and inspire. So let me give a hand of recognition to Ash Williams. Mr. President, I now present you. Thank you. Right. Tyler Russell with Enterprise Floor. All right. Thanks. 
Hello and Dom, uh, happy to be here. Um, as they said, I'm Chief of Staff at Enterprise Florida. My name's Tyler Russell. So um, as Dom said, he's a board member um, at Enterprise Florida and so is Jose. So we're happy to be here uh, supporting the organization and, and uh, the keynote address uh, today. So I'll keep it short. I see a lot of familiar faces here. And so I think a lot of people probably understand the mission of Enterprise Florida and even myself, I'm eager to hear Jose. So uh, I know y'all aren't here to hear me talk, but um, as Dom alluded to, Enterprise Florida is the state's economic development agency. It's often referred to as the Florida Department of Commerce. So the main goal is to promote Florida throughout the world as the premier place to do business, both through business development and through international trade and development. And so Enterprise Florida has offices in Tallahassee, Orlando, and Miami. And um, we support companies who are interested in doing business in Florida, either expanding their footprint or relocating and creating their footprint here in Florida. And so um, we uh, we're happy to uh, be here and um, and that's, uh, that's really all I uh, have to say. So uh, thank you for the time. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. So now I'd like to introduce the head table. Uh, you, I introduced Dom, I've introduced Tyler. I'd like to go to the left side of the table, you're right. Today I'd like you to meet uh, a new member, Kate Clark. Kate is the managing partner at Cypress Capital and Kate is a new member of the Economic Club. As I stated, she has served the financial industry. I'm going to juxtapose her resume to give you the financial side and then a personal bit at the end, so watch for that. Kate is an accredited investment fiduciary in AIF and a certified financial planner. Kate holds a certified plan fiduciary advisor credential and a Series 7 securities license held through LPL Financial. LPL Financial will have a person here to speak to us in January. She also holds a Series 66 securities license held through both Cypress Capital and LPL and insurance licenses for variable life, variable annuities, fixed life, fixed annuities, health and disability insurance. And as we like to do, we talk about their degrees. Kate received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Florida and a Certificate of Financial Planning from Florida State University, and now the personal. In her spare time, Kate and her husband raise cattle on the family farm near us in Green. Yeah, wonderful. Welcome, Kate. <laughs> Seated next to Kate is Jose Sill, our speaker. Marion is going to introduce him formally in just a minute. Marion Hoffman is a member of our club's executive committee. She serves as our vice president, president elect, and she is a member of our club's board of directors. Marion is vice president currently of business solutions for indelible business a national management consulting firm. She works with the Indelible leadership team to grow the private business sector for Indelible. You may recall that Indelible was a primary sponsor of our August program featuring Freddie Figures and Indelible's president, uh, Jamal Sowell, spoke to our club. Prior to that, Marion was vice president of strategic development with Enterprise Florida in Florida, in Tallahassee, and before that, Associate Vice President of Government Relations and the Director of Government Relations with the University of Florida for 20 years. But Marion shared with me that perhaps she is most proud of her prior experience as Director of Government and Communications and Government Relations for Burger King Corporation. So. Marion, the floor is yours. Introduce our speaker. It was really nice today when Steve gave me a Whopper pin. I was like, yes. <laughs> it's a great honor for me to introduce an outstanding Florida-grown business leader. Jose Sill grew up in Miami and graduated from Berlin Jesuit Prep, where he was the starting quarterback. He graduated with a BA in history and political science from Tulane University, then went on to earn his JD from the University of Pennsylvania. And by the way, Tulane is 10 and two this year if you haven't been following their football, so I know you're very proud of them. <laughs> Jose's father was 18 when he immigrated to the United States. 
His mother's family came to the country by ferry boat in 1960 when she was just 14. Jose's mother, Marta Leda Hernandez, used to joke that Jose's grandfather was imprisoned by the Castro regime, not for his political affiliation, but because, quote, he had a big mouth. <laughs> I think I'd like your mother. <laughs> Jose began his career in the legal department of Burger King Corporation. Several of his colleagues have told me that he's a motivator and a team builder who makes meetings enjoyable through his great sense of humor. After briefly serving as vice president and general manager for Walmart stores in Florida, Jose rejoined Burger King in roles ranging from executive vice president and president of Europe, the Middle East and Africa for Burger King worldwide to president of Burger King Corporation. He was appointed CEO of Restaurant Brands International in 2019. And as you know, they have four iconic brands that he will talk more about today. Jose serves on the board of directors of Enterprise Florida, Visit Florida, the Florida Chamber of Commerce. He's also active in the Florida Council of 100, the Orange Bowl Committee, and he co-served, co uh, he served as the co-chair of the Burger King Macklemore Foundation. He'll tell you more about that as well. In 2021, Jose was selected as Restaurant Industry Leader of the Year by Restaurant Business Magazine, and he was named South Florida Ultimate CEO by the South Florida Business Journal. But one of Jose's Belen classmates remarked what a devoted father Jose is and how he punched above his weight when he married Annie Gonzalez 26 years ago. They have one daughter, Nicole, they have a son, Jose, and they are the next generation of business leaders. So without further ado, please welcome my friend and your luncheon speaker, Mr. Jose Sill. Well, that was a pretty amazing uh, welcome. So thank you very much, Marion, and thank you all for, uh, for being here. Thank you. Uh, for letting me join and share some thoughts um, this afternoon. Thank you to, to Lowe and to the Economic Club of Florida, uh, not just for the uh, introduction and the warm welcome, but also for all the great work that you do uh, in this uh, great state. Um, we've been doing business here, as Marion mentioned, uh, Burger King started uh, in Florida in 1954. We had businesses in Jacksonville, we had businesses in Miami, but we are a homegrown Florida business. And today, Many, many years later, we still call Florida home uh, because it's such a great state uh, to do business. Uh, the environment is good. The talent uh, that we're uh, bringing into the state is fantastic. We've, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but we've evolved tremendously as an organization. You know, from the old days, I was talking to uh, Katrina Roll earlier. She, she told me she started working at Burger King at the age of 14 up in Opelika, uh, well, it's down from here, but up from where I live in Miami. Um, and she's, you know, she was mentioning that she would take orders at the Burger King uh, with a grease pencil. We've evolved quite a bit since then. We've hired engineers and now we have technology in the restaurants. But, but the, the point is, is that Florida uh, is a fantastic place to do business. And that's not by chance, that's by design. And it's by design from the government but I think more importantly, uh, from people like you that are involved, that are engaged, uh, and that bring businesses together uh, and, and help create an environment where entrepreneurship and, and commercial enterprise can drive uh, communities forward. And that's, I think, a super powerful uh, combination. It's why Florida today is, is what it is. So I'm really happy to be here and very proud uh, to have a chance to share uh, some thoughts here in our company. The slides are over there. Um, so it's not that straightforward, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you a few slides. You don't have to pay attention as much to that, but, uh, but from time to time, there'll be some uh, figures that you can look at. As I mentioned earlier, um, let's see, there it goes. We have uh, four amazing brands, uh, Burger King, Popeyes, Tim Hortons, and, and Firehouse Subs. And we're, we're pl proud to call Florida home. Three of our brands uh, call Miami uh, home. Um, Tim Hortons is based out of Canada, and, and that's our, our hometown uh, globally for, for the company. Personally, I'm proud to, to call Florida home as well. Miami, as I said earlier, and Marion mentioned, I was born and raised there. Uh, it's, you know, I've been all over the world. I've lived in Europe uh, for about a decade. 
my kids grew up there. My, my daughter went to high school there. My son went to junior high school there. Um, but we always come back home. Miami's always been uh, the place that, uh, that we call home and, uh, and, uh, and we're really proud to do that. Marion mentioned my mom. Um, she was a, an educator for many years, 35 years plus in the school system in Miami-Dade County. And she was a, a very, very tough person as it, as it related to us growing up. And me in particular, I was a bit rambunctious as a kid. Um, never, didn't want to study as much as I probably needed to. And I remember growing up as a, as a, as a young child, I'd like to be outside playing sports. And, uh, and she'd tell me, she'd call, she knew all my teachers at school and she'd get all the information from them about my progress in school or lack thereof. And, um, and I remember one day she, t she sat me down and said, listen, you're, you've got potential, but you're, you know, you're too busy you know, not studying, you're playing games with your friends, you're outside. You need to study, you need to apply yourself because if you don't, if you don't, you're gonna end up working at Burger King one day. <laughs> And, you know, thankfully I did. I'm very proud of that. And I remind her of that on a, on a, on a regular basis. And look, it's, it's no surprise to, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us here that, uh, that three of the, the world's most iconic brands, um, Burger King, Popeyes, and our newest brand, Firehouse Subs, uh, call Florida home. Um, I've had the honor, as Marion mentioned, of being the CEO of this incredible company for the last uh, almost four years. It'll be four years in January. Um, Burger King started that in, in Miami right by the airport in 1954. Firehouse Subs started in Jacksonville uh, in 1994. And Popeye started in New Orleans, uh, but in, in 2017 when we acquired the brand for, for $1.8 in cash, uh, we brought the brand down from uh, Atlanta to, to Miami, and, and now that's the, uh, the headquarters uh, for, for the business. And we've stayed here, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, of the great environment uh, and also the great talent that's being attracted uh, to, to this state uh, consistently and the great talent that's being generated from the university system that we have uh, in our state. A little bit about our company. Um, let me see if I can go to the next slide here. There we go. When we talk about the company and when I talk about the company, the first thing uh, that I like to share is the big dream that we have. We collectively as a, as a team and as an organization have a dream, a vision or a mission, but we call it our big dream to, to build the most loved restaurant brands in the world. It's the first thing I did when I addressed the company day one that I was announced as, as the, uh, the, the new CEO in January of 2019. I, I wanted to lay uh, a vision and a mission and a, and a dream for the company that was aspirational, that was purpose-led uh, and driven, uh, and something that was really, really hard to do. And if you think about it, in the restaurant space, to build the most loved restaurant brands in the world is quite difficult to do. Um, you can have a really loved restaurant in a particular part of, this, of a city, in Tallahassee or in Miami or somewhere else, but to build brands that have the level of penetration and presence that we have around the world. We have 29, uh, low mentioned 28,000, we actually have 29,000 restaurants, and we add about 1,500 uh, plus or minus a year, um, every year, uh, consistently. Uh, we're one of the largest restaurant companies in the world. We have some of the largest restaurant brands in the world, but our mission is not to be the biggest or the most financially successful. It's to be the most loved. It's all about creating that connection through our franchisees with uh, our guests that, that really create the, the, the momentum that the brands have and ultimately the outputs that we measure as a, as a uh, public company, sale, traffic sales, uh, profitability, and, and, uh, and share price, which are the things that, uh, that Ash and his team look at from time to time, uh, as, he, as he mentioned to me up there in the, in the meeting earlier. How do you build a loved brand, or in our case, four loved brands? There are five things that we focus on uh, as an organization. First, it's being brand led. So it's less about the corporation and it's all about the brands. Second, it's about focusing on exceptional uh, guest experiences. Uh, ultimately, brands and restaurant brands in particular go as the experience for the customer goes. If you forget that, if you don't focus on that, if that's not your core mission, then you're in the wrong business. Um, third is driving digital uh, innovation and leading 
in, in digital innovation. And so we've gone from a very analog approach to the restaurant experience to a very digital uh, experience. And, and the pandemic helped accelerate that tremendously. We were already in the journey, but because of um, lockdowns and because dining rooms were closed and because people didn't really want to, they didn't really know what to do uh, with each other and how to interact with each other, technology, off-premise, contactless experiences became something more powerful and, and accelerated our journey uh, to becoming a digital-led brand and business. The fourth is modeling excellence uh, as a franchisor. Uh, so, so being exceptional at taking care of our franchisees. We're essentially 100% franchise owned. So every restaurant you see anywhere in the world, like coming in here today, I saw three. I saw a, a Burger King. I saw a, a Popeyes a little bit further down and I saw Firehouse Subs. And we have Tim Hortons, by the way, in, uh, in Publix. We're selling uh, coffee pods there. Um, every restaurant that we have anywhere in the world is uh, with, with 100 restaurants being the exception are owned and operated by franchisees. And so for us to win, they need to win. For us to be successful, they need to be successful. And that means they need to have the tools that, they, that need to be provided uh, on, on how to train people, how to hire good people, how to run good operations. We need to provide financial um, uh, help, give them financial guidance so they can run their businesses effectively. And they need to make money and they need to make good returns on their investments uh, in order for them to be successful. That's an obsession and a priority for us as, as an organization. And then what drives all of this is our fifth kind of pillar, and that's living a culture that attracts and retains the, the best talent in the world. And so we're essentially an, an intellectual property business. We own brands. Um, what drives these brands ultimately is the success of our franchisees and our teams helping them get there. And so our focus is on those five things. We think if we do those really well, we're gonna be able to build love restaurant brands. And then the output of that will be exceptional traffic, exceptional sales, profitability, and growth uh, as an organization. And incidentally, uh, very recently, actually this, um, a few months ago it came out, Harvard Business School published a, a paper. It was called uh, Restaurant Brands 2.0. Uh, and it was basically a, a deep dive into our company uh, to, to talk about our history, our journey, and, and some of the changes uh, that we've made in our company and our culture to really drive an acceleration of, of, of growth uh, around the globe for, for our, what was three brands and now is four brands. So it's really exciting. If you have a chance to read it, please take a look. Now, one of the things they touched on in that session, in that uh, report was our values. And this is, I think it might be hard to read there, uh, but this is really critical for us in terms of creating the culture in the organization that drives uh, all the, the, the brands and the direction that we're trying to drive them in. The first is, first uh, of our core values is to dream big. And, and, and why? Because life is too short uh, for small dreams. And setting, having a big ambitious goal, having big uh, targets for the organization is, is a hallmark and, and a foundation of how we think about uh, driving the business. Uh, the second value is ownership. Uh, because you value things more, when you own them. And, and here we're kind of uh, juxtaposing uh, employees versus owners because employees behave differently than owners and owners uh, come to the table with a little bit more. They, might, they, they turn off the lights when they're done, they leave a room because they, they're paying the bills. Uh, we want people in our organization to behave like owners. And when they do, they get more. They usually achieve more uh, they get more in terms of compensation. They get rewarded as well with equity, so they become actual owners and have uh, shares in the company. Ownership mindset is critical in, in our view, in my view, uh, for success. The third value is meritocracy, which means it's, in the, it's the opposite of democracy. The meritocracy is all about performance. So your growth, your success is based entirely on what you do and how you do it. Uh, it's not the same for everybody. Uh, that's a different approach. Our view is the people that perform the best uh, get the most opportunity. Um, fourth is diversity. A wide range of voices and perspectives makes us stronger. This uh, we brought new to our values in 2020 because uh, in particular, I feel that this is a, a key driver of success, having more perspective, more viewpoints, creating um, a positive tension 
and disagreement uh, as a leadership team, really powerful to get to the best ideas. I think when you get to a situation where everybody has the same ideas, everybody's supportive of, this, of the ideas that someone has, there's no debate, there's no challenging, be careful. Be careful. You usually take the wrong turns and go down the, the, the wrong hills on, uh, in, in those types of environments. I encourage and create an environment where we challenge each other in a healthy way, in a respectful way, but ideas need to get beat up and ideas need to be mixed from time to time if you're going to get to the best solutions and the best ideas and the best plans to drive the business forward. Fifth uh, is of our values is creativity and innovation. Find ways to do things differently to make them better. I, I think in, and in terms of big companies or brands like ours, creativity and innovation are typically aligned or associated with marketing. Uh, but there's a lot of really good ideas and creativity and innovation that comes in operations to make things better and simpler for our team members in the restaurants to execute and deliver the Whopper or the chicken sandwich that you come, that you come and get. We encourage, and I encourage, creativity and innovation everywhere in the organization except one area, accounting. <laughs> I'd, I'd like for that team to go straight down to fairway um, and not be creative. Just, uh, just follow the rules. Um, and then finally, our sixth value is, is authenticity. Uh, be a hardworking, good person. And, and when I look back, at, uh, Harvey and I spoke briefly uh, before the, the lunch and I, uh, I talked to him and he asked me about the pandemic and how difficult was that. It, it was challenging like most companies and you know, you probably heard tons of stories about that, but the, the best part about the pandemic and, and how we came together as a team is that one of the core values that we leaned on is to make decisions and doing the right thing. Be a good person and be a hardworking good person. When you use that as your guiding post or, or guiding light, you're usually going to end up in the right place. Um, so these are our values. This is what we lean on consistently. And, and you know, my view, this is what, what the company is all about. This is how people behave when the leaders are not around. Uh, and this is what drives you know, outsized performance and ultimately gets us to, to where we, uh, we want to go. I think um, there's a, a few other uh, components from, from our vantage point that I think is, is important. One is our team, uh, it's a small team for a big company. They value our values. They respect our values and they really hold us accountable to it. And one of the things that we've challenged each other over the years is, is that we want not just management and leadership, myself, HR to own this. We want the entire organization to own this and to recognize people when they're displaying in a big way one of our values, but also calling them out when they're not, uh, when they're running counter to one of our values. And when you create that type of ownership around culture and values in, in an organization, you create something uh, quite, quite special. I'm proud to say that over the last few years, our, our engagement uh, and our retention numbers have been strong, uh, even in, in a very challenging uh, working environment. And we've also made a pivot in the last couple of years uh, to create our what we call our restaurant brands for good, uh, which is our sustainability uh, framework uh, that, that focuses on three pillars, uh, the food we serve, the communities, uh, and the people which we uh, impact and support, and the planet that we live on. Uh, and you can visit our website, you can go into depth there we we update it on an annual basis uh, and we talk about the things that are having that we first talked about the impact that we have on the planet our carbon footprint and then now we've laid out a plan uh, to address uh, a number of different areas in particular on the beef supply uh, in particular on single use cups uh, paper cups that uh, the coffee business in particular has a challenge with uh, and then with with Popeyes we're focused quite a bit on animal welfare uh, our my view our view is that having a really strong view and plan around sustainability is important not because of public relations or because of investor relations but because our customers care about it our guests care about it they're researching companies and brands and they're they're um, visiting brands that uh, associate with their values and their views and so having the right perspective on this and a plan to address it is is massively important and the other piece is we recruit uh, hundreds of, of undergraduate students every year. The first question, I go to many of these presentations, the first question I get inevitably every time 
is around our view on sustainability. What are you doing about the planet? What's your footprint and, and how are you gonna reduce it and get to net zero? People care about it. It's important. And so it's important for us as, as an organization. I wanted to share a bit about our, our impact as a global business. Um, we, you see, I think there's a, oh, let me go back before I go to Florida. There we go. Um, so we, we have a, a role in, in having a positive economic impact all around the world in places we operate. Um, our brands globally have more than 29,000 restaurants. Uh, we operate in more than 110 countries and territories. We have about 2,000 corporate employees and our franchisees employ more than 500,000 uh, team members around the world. And we continue, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we continue to, to, to grow our restaurant count every year uh, with Burger King, Popeyes, Tim Hortons, and, and soon we'll start building uh, firehouse subs uh, in international markets. Um, we've, we're located everywhere, uh, almost everywhere. We started to develop in, in Africa, which is uh, one of the, the great opportunities, uh, which will be a, an opportunity for folks that join the company 10 years from now uh, to build out uh, and, and be uh, really a key driver of growth for the company for years to come. We have presence now with Tim Hortons in China. We, we opened four years ago. We now have more than 500 restaurants. We opened Tim Hortons in Mexico, uh, and it's doing quite well. It's in Monterrey, and it's moving uh, kind of southwest towards um, the, the, the capital. We've opened Popeyes in the UK and Mexico. We opened Popeyes in the Middle East, uh, in Saudi Arabia and other markets. And we've opened Tim Hortons and Popeyes in India uh, very recently. So these are just some examples of places we've uh, opened. Uh, but our view is, is very long-term. We're not there to plant flags and, and make a, uh, an exciting press release about one opening. We, we believe uh, we can have thousands of restaurants in these markets and, and be part of the communities. And in all cases, we have local partners who have local teams who really take ownership of the brand and make it, you know, th th about 80% of it is, is uh, kind of global standards, but, but about 20% of it, menu items, beverages, uh, service modes are local and, it, and people engage very well with the brands digitally in particular because of that localization that we allow for, for our brands to, uh, to, to be meaningful at, at the local level. In Florida, uh, our brands have more than 1,100 restaurants. Um, this is Burger King, Popeyes, and, and Firehouse Subs. We don't have any Tim Hortons restaurants yet uh, in Florida, uh, but we're working on it. We have 1,000 plus uh, corporate employees. Uh, we have over 23,000 uh, team members that, uh, that call one of our brands uh, their employer, um, and, and also those that work in, the, in our corporate locations. Uh, as I mentioned, while we don't have Tim Hortons in Florida yet, we've started to bring the brand. So it's Tim Hortons, for those of you that don't know, is, is ubiquitous in Canada. It's, uh, there's about 4,000 restaurants in, of Tim Hortons in Canada, one for every 9,000 people. It's the single most penetrated uh, quick service restaurant brand anywhere in the world. There's not a single brand anywhere like Tim Hortons in Canada. Um, we started to develop the brand in, in, in south of the Canadian border, um, and it makes sense that we would do well in Buffalo. We have almost 200 restaurants in Buffalo. Um, if you watch a Buffalo uh, Bills game, I know most folks here are Dolphins fans, right? Um, if, uh, if you watch a Buffalo's uh, game, you'll see from time to time Tim Hortons advertised in the stadium because it's pretty well known in, in that part of the, of the country. We have restaurants in Michigan, which also makes sense because it's on the eastern part of or the western part of Ontario. And then we have restaurants in Ohio, quite a few restaurants in Ohio. But that's as far south as we've gone. Recently, actually in, in August, we opened our first uh, southern restaurant, if you will, in Texas. We opened in Houston to, uh, to much success. And we have plans to develop that market out. We will then move into Dallas and to other parts of Texas. We're opening later or earlier uh, in, in 23. We're going to open in Georgia near Atlanta. And then we're working our way down to, uh, to Florida. In the meantime, you can go to Publix. You can go to the one right here, which is about four minutes away. And you can buy Tim Hortons coffee. You can buy the Keurig cups. You can buy uh, the ground coffee. And you can also buy it in cans. Uh, and we've seen the brand do really well here in Florida. There's about 3.5 million Canadians 
that either call Florida home or come here for the, you know, the, the least pleasant part of, uh, of the year in, up in Canada, which we're actually heading into now. Um, so, so Florida is, is going to be a tremendous market for Tim Hortons, and we're really excited about that, but we're taking our time to make sure we find the right partners and we do the right thing in terms of building the, the, brand, uh, the brand presence. Now, in addition to the restaurants, we have a really strong uh, philanthropic uh, component, which is really important in terms of, uh, of how our brands and how our franchisees connect locally uh, in their communities. Um, so we, we, have, we make positive impacts uh, through the amazing philanthropy uh, with each of our foundations, and, and they continue to give back. So the Burger King Foundation, uh, which started uh, in, in homage to our founder, Jim McElmore, uh, is all about education. Um, and it was founded grassroots by our franchisees when, when Jim passed away in the 90s. Uh, and it was all about raising money for scholarships of, need, of students in need in high school that were going to college. And we, uh, in the early 2000s, took over that foundation and then started uh, to, to kind of globalize it. And now we're, we've raised over 50 million uh, globally. Uh, and we, we've given uh, most of that uh, here in the US to scholarships and internationally. We've built libraries, we've built schools. Uh, so it's, it's beginning to gain a ton of traction and it's all about education. The Popeyes Foundation supports hunger relief efforts and it was quite impactful during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we, we, we put a lot of effort in New Orleans and Louisiana in particular where there were some challenges because of the pandemic and, and uh, fundraising and supporting local communities on, on hunger relief efforts is their focus. The Firehouse Subs Foundation uh, is amazing, the Public Safety Foundation. It raises funds for frontline uh, life-saving equipment. They've raised, in, in, since 2005, they've raised over $85 million, uh, and all that money goes to local, uh, either fire departments or police departments that need uh, life-saving equipment. It's a little known fact, but most municipalities are unable to fund the needs uh, of their um, first responders. And so they can't, they don't have enough uh, money to, to buy AEDs or other equipment, uh, the jaws of life. They come to us, they come to Firehouse and they submit a grant application. We, we get hundreds of them each quarter. And then we provide, we don't, we don't give them the money. We actually buy the equipment. We also put a little logo on it that says Firehouse Subs. Um, little marketing doesn't hurt. Um, but, we, but we provide hundreds of thousands each quarter uh, to, to police departments and fire departments in need. And it's a super, I've seen several of those moments where we've actually granted this and the stories that people tell about the equipment that's been provided and the, the lives it's saved uh, is pretty amazing. It's why Firehouse is such a powerful brand uh, and the team from the CEO of that brand all the way down to the team members, they, they truly believe that they need to sell more subs so they can save more lives. It's pretty awesome. And then, and then fire, the Tim Hortons Foundation camps um, have, have helped uh, under, underprivileged or uh, underprivileged and underserviced kids in Canada through camps and, uh, and a number of, of other uh, different uh, philanthropic activities. So that's really important for us. I wanted, I've got a couple minutes left and I wanted to touch on, on the, um, I'm gonna cut through here real quick and get to these headlines. Um, you know, as business leaders, we know that, that uh, it's not just these catastrophic events that, that foundations deal with that impact our business. It's also um, the challenges that we face in an economy uh, as we're dealing with now. Uh, we've, over the last two years, not only the pandemic has impacted us, but the challenges around commodities, wage inflation, some of the challenges we're facing in different uh, markets around the, the state, around the country are, are pretty powerful. Our franchisees are feeling the pressure, our consumers are feeling the pressure. And I think the question that comes up from time to time is how do you deal with an environment like this in the restaurant space? Um, when, when people are concerned about uh, what's happening around them, all the headline, headlines that they read. I, I think the most important piece from my vantage point and, and how we think about it is that you need to remember what business you're in. and and when everyone's hunkering down and thinking about cutting cost, our view has been, remember the guest, remember our franchisees, let's take care of the people that take care of our brands and our business. And so we, we double down in these environments. We double down on 
team member training. We double down on quality of products. We double down on investing in, in restaurant uh, image and design. We double down on technology because we view that if, if we do a good job uh, in this environment, people will remember us and will come back more often because we took care of them in the difficult, uh, in the difficult moments. Um, I, I think there are a, a good number of examples, none more important than what we announced recently with, uh, with Burger King. We announced a plan that we call Reclaim the Flame, where we've invested 120 million, or we committed to investing 120 million dollars in marketing. Um, we've uh, committed to 30 million in digital investments, and then another 250 million uh, in Royal Reset investments, which is all about image and the design and, and the look and feel of our restaurants. And we're doing this alongside our franchisees. Uh, we built this plan together with them. Uh, we came to the table and said, "Look, we will contribute, but you will need to as well." And so the combined effort of of our franchisees and, and us will put nearly a billion dollars in the business over the next few years. Uh, and we think it's one of the most powerful commitments that we can make collectively as a brand and a, and a business and a system uh, to our consumers and to our guests. Uh, and we're beginning to see uh, the benefits of that. I think over time, we'll see significant benefits and we're very committed to this as the way to uh, address a challenging environment is to remember the business you're in, remember the teams that got you there, remember the franchisees that got you there and double down on that. Um, the more you focus on, on creating a, a awesome, amazing experiences for your guests and for your team members, the more likely you're going to be the type of brand that people love, the type of, which is gonna be the type of brand that people frequent and visit more often, which is ultimately what's the driver uh, of our business. There's proof of that. Um, these are recent highlights in terms of our performance. We've seen really strong performance in terms of our system-wide sales, uh, in terms of our digital uh, expansion. We've seen really strong growth in terms of comparable or like-for-like -like sales in, in our brands uh, over the last quarter, which we just reported uh, a, few, a few weeks ago. Uh, we're early days, I believe, in terms of our, the potential that this company has and our brands have. We've seen our digital business go from essentially zero three or four years ago to now a third of our business is digital. Uh, three and a half billion dollars of sales uh, in, in the third quarter alone came through digital channels all around the world. Um, so we're really excited about that and we were seeing tremendous excitement from our franchisees uh, growing our brands domestically in Canada, uh, down in Latin America and all around the world. Uh, and so our commitment is to remain focused on and, and, and we remain really confident in the plans that we built, all focused on our guests on our franchisees' success, uh, which ultimately drives traffic, sales, and, and profitability. So with that, I, I wanna say uh, I'm very thankful and grateful for the chance to be here. I know we have a short uh, window here, so I, I wanted to share a little bit about our company, a little bit about the environment, a little bit about how we think about that, and, and also uh, gratitude towards the, the great state of Florida that we live in and that we have an opportunity to operate in. And I'd love to be able to, um, to open it up if anyone has any questions, comments, I'm happy to take those. Thank you very much. You. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I would say that it's it's unlike anything. It's a, as I said, it's a pretty unique brand. But what it's uh, it's it started as a coffee shop and baked goods in 1964 in Canada. Uh, it, Tim Horton is a coffee is a hockey player who right. played at, at in Toronto uh, for the Maple Leafs, and uh, he started a hamburger concept that didn't work, and then he converted it to a coffee and donut shop, and and over the years it's become a bit more than that. It serves all sorts of beverages. We have um, loaded wraps, bowls, soups, um, and we, we do a, a tremendous job there. And it's a it's a really iconic brand in um, in Canada and, and everywhere you turn. If you're in Toronto, you could stand in, in, at the door of one of them, and you could see the next one right down the street. It's that uh, it's that well uh, penetrated. What's exciting is that it's not only a Canadian brand. We think it has potential to grow 
as, as an example, uh, we're in China in four years, we've opened uh, 500 plus restaurants and, and we see a path to, to many, many more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, when Florida's uh, passed the minimum wage amendment, at the time I was very concerned about the impact it would have on business and ultimately the consumer. Well, since then, wages have escalated so much anyway. I'm wondering, is the minimum wage in Florida really a non-issue now? Uh, look, I, th I think minimum wage, uh, the, the increases we've seen over the last uh, four or five years have been pretty staggering on a relative basis. Truth be told, we operate in many uh, high wage markets in Europe and in, in, in Switzerland and in, in many markets where minimum wage is something like 50,000 um, equal to 50,000 US for the, the starting employee. So I think we know how to work in those environments and there's some benefits to higher wages in terms of uh, rejuvenating the economy and, and creating more consumption, uh, especially at the entry level of, of the economy. So we work in any environment, we can figure it out in any environment. Um, it certainly has put pressure on our franchisees uh, on the wage line in particular. Uh, and if you're not growing, uh, then wage inflation and commodity inflation uh, will have a negative impact on the profitability of a franchisee. So our focus is to try to drive continued growth in our business uh, so that our, our franchisees' uh, profitability is growing at a faster rate than either wage inflation or commodity inflation. So the short answer is we can figure it out in any environment, but it, you need to be growing in order to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, Jose. I enjoyed visiting you with you earlier. And, uh... We had a great chance to talk about our growing up and my affinity for your uh, your company uh, growing up. What I failed to mention is I'm an alumni of your company. When I was in college, I worked at uh, the Burger King in Gainesville. Oh, fantastic. Along with uh, uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. Uh, I spent uh, a semester or two working there. She spent four days and decided that <laughs> she would seek other pastors to, uh, to work in. Yeah. But I, I, I was appreciative of that experience in learning the dis discipline of the company and the logistics of the company and the franchise operator there who at the time it was uh it was the top sales burger king i think in the entire franchise group that, that one right there on yeah. university mm -hmm. avenue i don't know how it's doing now but he really paid very close attention to that franchise which brings me to my uh, to my question how is it right now you spoke in eloquently and with the proper verge ver verbiage associated with customer service i think one of your competitors knocks it out of the park in customer service we, you probably know who i'm talking yeah. about and there's probably they're based a, out of atlanta there's probably a line around <laughs> their facilities just down the street that are built right across the street from each other but my focus groups tell me that they knock it out of the park yeah. would you address how they do it because they're almost all franchise operated as well how they make the breakthrough with their franchisors to make that connection to get the people that most people really love it's not the product for sure it's a it's okay i don't i won't diss them um but people love going there i think because of the people of that company how can we get burger king and your other companies like that and i do think that that maybe with your acquisition of firehouse subs they had a culture of that kind of thing going on that is a cultural thing to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it, probably the, the the single most challenging thing in in this business is to create uh, is to go from having either average or inconsistent uh, experiences in franchise businesses to having exceptional experiences. What he's referring to are the folks out of uh, Atlanta that don't open on Sundays, um, and 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 truly they they do an exceptional job. They are the standard uh, by which everyone is grasping for in terms of customer service, and they they win simply and and purely because of that. I think they have a couple of of, of unique elements of their business model. But what's exciting from our perspective is that we have many restaurants. If we if we we have 7,500 Burger Kings in the U.S., we have 3,000 Popeyes. Uh, we have about 700 Tim Hortons in the U.S. and about 1,200 Firehouse Subs. When we look at 
top performing restaurants, our top quartile of restaurants, they're in the same league. They do the same, they perform just as well in terms of customer service metrics, just as well in terms of throughput and volumes uh, and profitability. And so the, the challenge is, what do you do about the bottom quartile? Um, so in franchising and, and what we do, uh, a big part of it is, pro is providing support. Um, and so we, over the last couple of years, we've made significant investments in our field operations, in our training support as well. We were, I think we were understaffed in those areas and we've made some investments there. Uh, we've also uh, made investments in simplifying the operations and simplifying the menu so that our team members can execute better. And we launched what we call an employee value proposition for the franchisees to be able to, for them to deploy into their restaurants uh, a structured process for hiring, for training, for retention, and creating an environment in their restaurants that uh, is conducive to uh, good guest service and, and great uh, results for, for their team members. So we've seen good pr progress, actually the last four quarters, uh, we've seen really good progress in terms of operational results. That's the, the, the number one focus for our team at, at, at Burger King, in particular in the US, is to elevate the experience and have it more consistent across all of our restaurants, including image and look and feel and technology you know, helping us get there. So you, I'd like for you to come to my office and talk to the team so they can hear from you. Hey, listen, we need to raise our game and get to, uh, get to that level of operation. Thank you. Well, yes, thank sir. you for sharing uh, some exciting developments and, and Dave had my question, but luckily I have two. So my second question uh, is, you didn't mention about doing business in Russia, and you mentioned that you do business in China. So I wonder if you would share with us a little bit about the calculus that y'all make on geopolitics, the, the risk versus the rewards of doing business in countries where the United States may not have a good relationship, um, and particularly interested about Russia. I assume that you're not doing business there now, but what about China in the future? Yeah, so we are not a political organization. Um, we run brands, and, and the way I think about it is that we should, it's my responsibility, it's our team's responsibility to bring our brands to as many people as we can. Um, there's nothing more American than to take, the, take an American brand uh, around the world. And it's, it's one of, to me, one of the proudest moments I've ever experienced is going to a market for the first time and, and raising the flag of Burger King or Popeyes or Tim Hortons or, and soon Firehouse Subs and being able to bring what we do well to people uh, from out, outside uh, of the US. So it, it, we, that's how I view it. There's certainly challenges out there and, and the, the way I think about it is that we, we have a long-term view. We're not, things will change from time to time. They change in this country from time to time, every four years uh, apparently. And, um, and sometimes environment is favorable, sometimes it's not favorable. Sometimes it's a bit rocky. Sometimes it's really smooth. Um, and, and places like China, like Russia, uh, like the continent of Africa will have volatility from time to time. But we have a long view. We want to be there for the long term. Um, we're, we're definitely struggling like everybody else is in China with, uh, with these intermittent lockdowns and, and crackdowns that the, uh, the government's applying because of COVID. It's not good for business. Uh, it's not good for our teams. They struggle uh, big time. There's issues geopolitically that aren't uh, our priority. That's not. It's not much we can do about it. Um, with uh, what we what happened was we had a business there that was franchise owned, 100%. We had a minority stake in that business. We've we've been working to sell that minority stake. Uh, we cut off uh, all relations with the team. Uh, we continue to run the restaurants. Uh, but they don't have support from us. We don't. Uh, they don't pay uh, anything to us, and anything that has come through, uh, which has trickled through earlier in the process, we've donated to um, uh, to UN uh, humanitarian efforts to support Ukrainian refugees that have been uh, left in a lurch because of the the um, unwarranted attack. And so, that's how we deal with it. We've got franchisees to address those difficult challenges the same way. We'll con if, as a global company with presence all around the world, we will continue to face challenging uh, environments and local environments. Our view will be to continue to focus on, on the guest and providing support to the franchisees. And if we need to close, we'll close. If we, if we need to make changes, we'll make changes. But we'll, we want to bring the brands to as many people as we can.
Thank you. I was going to ask that same question, Mr. Bishop. Yeah. Yeah. To it. Um, you two questions. There. No, yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let these ladies go behind me, but I did want to say that I work for the state fire marshal's office and we partnered very successfully with uh, firehouse subs to get cancer decontamination kits, the firehouse logo and everything, but out to the communities, um, particularly some of the volunteer fire departments. We have a lot of them in Florida. They don't have the same kind of equipment that like a Miami-Dade might have. Yeah. And everything's made of plastic now, catches on fire and it lets off stuff that's not good. And so anyways, super, super grateful for the partnership with- our health subs to protect Florida firefighters and their families. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate so much your attention to the values in your company, your aspirational goals, your focus on sustainability and things like that. But with the events of the last few years, I'd like you to go into a little bit more detail as to how did you handle the supply chain disruption the great inflation and cost of your individual ingredient items. How did you deal with it? What did you do with changed cost or changed quality standards? Or uh, explain a little bit about, you know, maybe actually the percentage of decrease in business you saw over the last two or three years and how that's come back. Uh, yeah, if we, we can probably have another lunch set up for this to talk about it. it was, there was a lot, but but in a in the, the last few years, I, I tell people that the pandemic was probably the, the most difficult stretch of time that I ever had as a business leader. Uh, when there was a moment in 2021 that we felt that we were moving on, and then, and then we faced supply chain challenges, we faced commodity pressures and the beginnings of a, of a radically challenging uh, commodity environment, wage challenges, staffing challenges. I almost wish we were pandemic, uh, much easier deal with the current environment. What, what's powerful about our business is, this, is the size of the brands and the scale that we have. And so from a supply chain standpoint, while we have faced challenges that we haven't seen in the past, we've been able to do pretty well because we have a network, an amazing network of supplier partners uh, here in the US, in Canada. We own the supply chain in Canada, so we, ma we manufacture coffee. We own the distribution centers, the trucks, and the distribution to the to the uh, restaurants in Canada, uh, and then we have third-party uh, uh, supply chain in international markets. For the most part, we were pretty well uh, uh, balanced throughout the process. We had moments of outages of certain products uh, in the U.S. when um, beef suppliers, pork suppliers, and chicken suppliers had issues in their manufacturing facilities. There was some spot outages that we face and others face as well, but we generally managed pretty well throughout the, the pandemic and, and the recent environment because of 50, 60 years of relationships in some cases with, uh, with our supply chain. And so we're pretty well positioned in terms of security of supply. In terms of cost, we've seen a, a, a drastic increase in what we call backdoor pricing. So the, the price we pay for products that come to the backdoor of a restaurant um, we have pricing power because of the strength of our brands, and we do a lot of analysis uh, to make sure we understand uh, the impact that pricing price increases will have on a consumer. So we want we we call we look at flow through. So if I take ten percent uh, or ten cents of price, how much of that ten cents goes to uh, to the bottom line? If you don't, if not all of it goes to the bottom line, it means you're losing traffic, uh, which means you're impacting consumer behavior because of the prices you're taking. So we test for that, we analyze that. We have third parties that give us a bunch of data that we put into uh, machine learning to figure out what the right pricing is in certain areas of the country. It's different by, by, by territory and by region. Uh, and then we look at competitors as well to make sure we don't go too far ahead of the competition and we remain competitive in each of our markets. The other thing we can do and, and that we have done is that addressing commodity inflation or margin pressure is not only about price. You can also manage your, your menu mix a bit. And so I'll give you an example. I was mentioning to somebody, to, I think to Ash earlier, we, uh, in, in the first quarter of 2022, we, we, re, we had a, a Whopper sandwich that sells normally for 529. We had it on a discount platform. So it was two for six. So the effective price was $3. We removed that product from the Whopper, which is our iconic product. We removed it from that platform 
and left it at its, at its normal everyday price. We, changed, we added different products. We reduced the price of that platform to, to two for $5, and we improved margins by 100 basis points. Um, so the customer wins because they got a better deal, and the franchisee wins because their margins improved because we took the Whopper off of a discount. So there's a number of things we can do together with our franchisees to improve the menu mix, which improves margins, and also provides a benefit to the consumer, which is ultimately the goal, right? You want more people to come because they see a good value, and you want the margins to be um, to be addressed positively. So, it's a full time job for a lot of people to make sure we don't do we don't make mistakes on that front, and that we keep testing and we run a lot of uh, of A/B testing as well through our digital platforms to determine uh, what price combinations work the best, and all of that helps us manage through these uh, these environments. Thank you. It's a good question. Well, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for being here, and Marion, for bringing one of our most iconic and worldwide brands in Florida, Tallahassee. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I do want to say, like my friend Katrina, <laughs> I was a cashier at Burger King in about 1980, wow. wearing the cute little hat and the brown <laughs> polyester yeah. uniform. So cute. Ka so, Katrina, Katrina liked the, 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 the red and yellow, right? <laughs> yeah. Red and yellow, not the brown one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was. It was yeah, polyester. I remember. But, but, but cute, it was cute. I was curious about the digital sales growth, 26% to 3.4 billion, representing 33% of system-wide sales. And I wonder if you could express what that really means. And I don't know what that means. I'd love to hear about yeah. it. So, so before digital, I, I think the restaurant business was one of the last big businesses to be impacted by, uh, by, by digital. So retail got impacted, a number of different areas got impacted. We felt, I think, felt that we had a moment because we were so well penetrated and so convenient and we had drive-throughs that that digital wouldn't necessarily impact us uh, delivery through third-party aggregators started to change that a few years back we started to invest in in creating our own apps in creating uh, apps that are relevant and allow people to customize and to get loyalty points and these sorts of things and so that we went from 0% sales digitally, meaning that nothing was being handled through a digital platform. Uh, and by digital, we mean ordering on an app, um, ordering and prepaying on an app, uh, ordering on a third party uh, delivery company, uh, either Uber Eats or DoorDash or, or one of those folks, ordering on our app, but getting delivery through a third party, uh, using a kiosk, um, ordering and getting loyalty points. So any of these transactions where we, we know that you're ordering uh, and experiencing the brand digitally, we consider a digital transaction. And we went from zero to now 33%. And, it's, and it depends on the market. In Canada, we're right around 35%. Um, in, in some European markets, we're 90 plus percent. In, in Asian markets, we're 90 plus percent. In, in Korea, we're 100%. Every transaction in any Korean restaurant, we have 500 restaurants there, every single one of them is digital. Um, and so why is that powerful? For two main reasons. One is it makes the transaction and the experience more convenient for the guest. You, can, you, can, you don't have to deal with the pressure of a line. You can take your time ordering. You can kind of explore the menu without pressure. So it's very convenient for the guest. Uh, and typically what we see is when you order digitally, you, your average transaction or check is higher than if you order uh, through a cashier, uh, an analog transaction, let's call it. So that's one. The second reason it's important is because typically in a digital transaction, we, you give us information about who you are. And then we're able to understand what you like, what you don't like, and I can personalize, or we can personalize marketing and promotions and offers for you that are relevant for you. And I can do the same for Katrina, or I can do the same for anyone and so the the marketing becomes better the offers become more relevant the experience for you becomes much more relevant and and engaging than if it was if we were just treating you like a mass market consumer and so in the end we want to get to 100 percent digital because we think we can provide more convenient better experiences for the guests and provide them a better offer uh, and a better marketing experience as well thank you Thank you all very much. So, Jose, for a bit of appreciation for you appearing at our club and uh, enlightening us so much.
to present you with this is two pieces, by the way. Wow. The base and the base, so you don't drop it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. You Thank you. So we're adjourned. Remember, the next one is December 15, and it'll be right back here. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. So where's, where's our photographer? So, Katrina, Barney, Barney.